Good morning, my sisters and brothers in Christ. Welcome to another Sunday School Hour. Today's topic is God is not fooled. The scripture text is Amos chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, and verses 18 through 27. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly bow this morning to thank you once again for allowing us to see another day and for the privilege of sharing in this teaching moment. Lord, thank you for your endless love, grace, and mercy. As we enter this period of study, please prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word. Fill us with your wisdom, knowledge, insight, and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The author is Amos. His name means burden or burden bearer. By the time Amos began his prophetic ministry around 760 B.C., Israel had been a divided nation for about 170 years. The events in the book of Amos took place during the reigns of King Jeroboam II of the northern kingdom and King Uzziah of Judah, the southern kingdom, a time when both kingdoms were experiencing great material prosperity but were spiritually poor. Jeroboam II led the nation to successful victories over their neighboring, um, their enemy neighbors in war, and as a result won lucrative trade routes that poured tremendous wealth into Samaria, northern Israel's capital city. It was a golden age for the wealthy, who built grand homes and proud public worship centers in Bethel and Dan. The land was fertile and produced abundant crops year after year. Even their, their um, enemy nations, those like Assyria and Egypt, seemed weak and ineffective at the time. Unfortunately, beneath the prosperity of this golden society, lay the tragedy of social injustice and economic disparity. The majority of the people had very little regard for God and his laws. They adopted the pagan rituals of the nations around them and had become a materialistic, pleasure-loving, politically ambitious class who advanced themselves by oppressing the poor. They continued their religious um, uh, rituals, but their hearts were far from God. The Bible is clear. God is all-seeing and all-knowing, Nothing gets by him, but many people think they can fool God with their empty and hypocritical religious rituals, but God looks at the heart. Mere religious activity doesn't fool him. It was against this background of prosperity and wickedness that the prophet Amos, a shepherd from Tekoa, a town in Judah, was called by God to deliver a series of messages to Israel. And although his message was first and foremost to the people in the north, those in Judah, needed to pay attention as well. In chapter 1, verse 2, Amos pictured the Lord as a crouching lion, roaring and leaping as he attacks his prey, the pounce, the tearing, and then death. Chapters 3, 4, and 5 begin with, Hear this word, indicating the importance of each message from the Lord. The first message was addressed to Israel. However, the phrase in chapter 3, verse 1, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, tells us that Judah was also included. In this message, Amos stated some of the reasons Israel was going to face God's judgment. Their lifestyle was not pleasing to God, and they would be dealt with. The message in chapter 4 begins with a reference to the women of Israel who were living in luxury, partly by oppressing the poor and needy in the land. God describes what he did to, in the past to get their attention and how they continually ignored him. Therefore, judgment was on the way. Amos' third and fourth messages are in chapter 5. These messages present one overall truth. The sovereign Lord would judge the nation as a whole for its legal injustice and religious hypocrisy. But he offered life to individuals, a small remnant, who would repent and seek him. Amos begins this chapter with a summons for the people to hear and lament over the death of the house of Israel. At every turn, Israel chose evil over good. The prophet accused them of mistreating the poor. He continues to point out their numerous other sins. They punished those who sought justice. They accepted bribes. They discriminated against the poor in lawsuits. Amos denounced the legal injustice that was perpetrated by robber judges who sold their court decisions to the wealthy and against government officials who overtaxed the poor. He also cited the landlords that overcharged for rent and subpar housing while claiming to be children of God. Sound familiar? Yes, this is still going on today. But God sees what we do. He is not fooled. And those that mistreat and oppress others and engage in dishonest business dealings, practices, will one day suffer his judgment. Let's get into our text. 
Amos chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you, as ye have spoken. Hate the evil, and love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. If the people would seek good and not evil, they might yet live. If they would go counter to the rapid corruption, if they would hate evil instead of hating righteousness, if they would maintain justice in the courts instead of trampling it, then they would enjoy the presence and deliverance of the Lord God of hosts. The Lord would be their defender instead of their judge. He would be with them just as they were claiming he was. The Lord is with us was Israel's ancient shout of assurance that their powerful God would fight for them in battle. But during the reign of Jeroboam II, this shout had become an empty slogan. The Israelites had fooled themselves into believing that the Lord would, would bless them and would deliver them from their enemies, regardless of their spiritual condition. But they were deluded. God was no longer with them. Their external prosperity, the blessings that they were experiencing materially, was misleading. It gave them a false sense of security. Amos emphasizes three crucial actions for the people in verse 15. First, they must hate the evil. God expected those living in sin to experience a complete change of heart, a change in affection of what they love. What once attracted them should now repel them as they drew closer to God. Second, they must love the good. The Lord demands that his people love him in his ways. How can we claim to love the good if we don't hate the evil? Third, they must establish judgment in the gate. Israel's treatment of the less fortunate indicated a disregard for God's law and disrespect for the lawgiver. Only a change of heart toward God could revive the justice that was constantly denied to the poor, widows, orphans, and strangers in the courts and daily life. However, if a handful, a remnant, would return and passionately seek the Lord, perhaps he would have mercy on that, repen that repentant remnant of, um, of Israel called here northern Israel, called Joseph, referred to as Joseph here. In verses 16 and 17, Amos concludes uh, his third message to Israel by returning to his opening plea and reminding the people of the judgment they would face if they failed to heed God's warnings. Look at verses 16 and 17. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, wailing shall be in the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, and they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing, and in all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Continuing in verses 18 and 20 through 20. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? The word woe in scripture often introduces messages of warning and judgment. The day of the Lord refers to a time when God will intervene in human affairs to judge the wicked and deliver the righteous. In the New Testament, it came to refer to Jesus' return and the judgment that will follow. Ideally, God's people should look forward to the day of the Lord. However, the Israelites had selfish reasons for desiring the day of the Lord. They were proud to be considered God's chosen people who would be delivered from all their enemies when he came to judge for our nations, though they were unfaithful in their covenant to the Lord. They somehow believed that the day of the Lord would be a blessing to them. Amos asked, to what end is it for you? The point is being God's covenant people comes with obligation. God's relationship with his people provides us with special blessings and privileges, but it also comes with the responsibility of faithful obedience to him. Israel had abandoned their responsibility. Therefore, contrary to their expectations, the day of the Lord would be a day of darkness for Israel and not light. God had passed judgment. This prophecy, like most Old Testament prophecy, carried an immediate fulfillment with the coming of the Assyrian invasion in 722 B.C., as well as a future fulfillment when Jesus returns. For the faithful, the day of the Lord would be glorious. But for the unfaithful, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As we get closer and closer to the second of coming of Christ, we must ask ourselves if that time will be a time of light 
or a day of darkness for us? The answer to that question is determined by whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 19, Amos illustrated the plight of the Israelites with two dark pictures. In both examples, a man believes that he is safe immediately before he meets his demise. Amos said that day would be like a man fleeing from a lion and suddenly encountering a bear. Can you imagine having a sigh of relief after escaping a lion and then having to face a bear? But the illustration goes further. Somehow you escape the bear, run into the house, close the door, and lean against the wall to get your breath, only to have a serpent come out of the wall and bite you. The ungodly will not be able to escape, hide, or find relief when the day of the Lord comes. In the New Testament, teaching on the future day of the Lord is very clear. The day will come when no one expects it, as a thief in the night. Sudden destruction will occur at the very time when men are speaking of peace and safety. And it will be as unavoidable as the birth of a child after labor pains has begun. Scripture references are 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, and 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. There will be no escape for those who have despised God's warnings. Romans chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, John saw people crying for the rocks to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. On the great day of his wrath. Amos repeats his warning in verse 20. The day of the Lord will be a time of darkness and not light. Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 warn that the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, all those, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. But then comes the promise to the righteous or the saved. But unto you that fear my name. Shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings? First Peter chapter 4 verse 17 tells us, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? Like the church today, the Israelites had developed a tendency to live in righteous religious hypocrisy. Jesus during Jesus' day, he was still warning the people to discontinue religious pretense and public showing. When you get a chance, read Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, and chapter 23, verses 21 through 24. Religious hypocrisy is empty worship. That means it has no value, and God will not tolerate it. Instead, Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In verses 21 through 23, Amos announces God's reaction to all that was going on in the worship centers. He was not pleased. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vows. Amos lists seven aspects of Israel's worship that God rejected. The feast days refers to the three annual pilgrimage festivals. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, also referred to as Passover, the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Scripture references are Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 through 19, and Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 16 and 17. Although the Lord ordained these feasts for his people, he now refers to them as your religious festivals. God rejects mere observance of days. He dislikes how people twist religion to their own ends instead of uh, the assemblies that he intended. When the nation of Israel split, King Jeroboam I set up golden calves to be worshipped in Bethel and Dan to prevent the people and northern Israel from going to Jerusalem to worship. Israel was called themselves splitting their worship between God and idols. God despised their feast days and gatherings for worship that accompanied their feasts. On many occasions, the Lord stated that he was pleased by the aroma of their offerings presented to him. But now the aroma of Israel's offerings were disgusting because their worship was not sincere. They were just going through the motions. Their hearts were not in it. Could God be saying to us today that he despises our religious activities? Although our churches have many members, 
Numbers do not determine whether or not a biblical ministry is being achieved. The true indicator of an effective ministry is the transformation of lives, lives that no longer conform to the ways of the world, to lives that please God. Are people being transformed? Continuing in verses 22 and 23, Amos continues with the list of things that God will not accept. These offerings were required by the Lord as part of the Old Testament sacrificial system. Burnt offerings were completely consumed by the fire. Meat offerings, also called grain or cereal, were offerings of flour and oil. The best part of the grain was given to the Lord. This offering celebrated that the Lord is the provider of what the land produces. Then you have peace offerings, also called fellowship offerings, were shared by the priest, the one that brought the sacrifice, and others. God detests religious hypocrisy, playing church, while continuing to live an ungodly life in private. He makes clear that he would not accept our tithes, our offerings, nor will he accept our hymns of praise. In fact, songs from the disobedient are like noise to his ears, and he simply will not listen to it. Take away from me the noise of thy songs. First of all, we have to understand that it's not the song that praises God. It is the heart from which the song comes. I will not hear the melody of thy vows. A vow is a harp. He also refused to hear the melody or the music from their instruments. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, Jesus quoted from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Thy people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It doesn't matter what we say with our lips if our hearts are not right. We have to make sure that our worship is sincere. How often is our worship service today mere entertainment? How often are our public prayers mere self-glorification? How often is our giving done with the intent to have God bless us with more or to get a tax deduction? We must examine ourselves. Verse 24. This is the climax of this chapter. It's a call for judgment and righteousness. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. The Lord was calling for a spiritual revival that would release a constant flow of social justice and righteous living. Practicing justice requires being actively concerned not only with knowing what it is, but also choosing to do what is just. And righteousness is closely tied to justice. To live righteously is to make certain that God's standards of what is right guides our daily decisions. God wants to see a mighty stream of justice flowing from among us, a river of righteous living that will never run dry. Now, in verses 25 through 27, God returns to denouncing Israel's religious hypocrisy by reminding them that this was not the first time they had offended him. From the beginning of Israel's history as a nation, they had a record of false worship. Verses 25 through 27. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and chewn your images, the star of your God which ye made to yourselves. Therefore I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. God recalls how it was not often to him but to a golden calf, the sun, the moon, stars, to Moloch, and other false gods, that many of them brought sacrifices and offerings during their 40 years in the wilderness. When you get a chance, look at Ex Exodus chapter 32. Also, Second Kings chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Because of their idolatry and hypocrisy in worship, God said he would send Israel into exile beyond Damascus, which pointed to the coming Assyrian invasion in 722 BC. The horror of exile was more than just the ruin of defeat and the shame of capture. For Israel, it meant being removed from the land of promise, the land of God's presence. This is what happens to all those that choose to live outside of the will of God, those that choose to love evil and not good. The Lord sends them into exile, away from his presence. That concludes our lesson. Until next time, may God bless and keep you. 
If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.